and we tried to figure out who could give the message in the best and most powerful way that she would be representing. And we could think of no one else and no one better than, of course, the editor-in-chief of the most prestigious medis medical journal in the world, namely Lancet. And it's an enormous privilege for me to give you here for the final intervention, Dr. Richard Horton of Lancet. Richard. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That was the most generous introduction I could have uh, hoped for when my phone went at six o'clock this morning. A remarkable, once in a generation opportunity lies before us to end preventable mortality within our lifetimes and to create a future that is truly sustainable. But what do we mean by sustainability? I don't want to talk about the health of individuals, of public health, or even of global health. I'd like to talk for a few moments about the health of our civilizations, the organization and the development of our society and our culture. Sustainability suggests at least two very simple ideas, preventing the collapse of our civilization and ensuring that our civilization flourishes. So how real is the threat of collapse? The history of the human species is the history of the birth, the rise, and the fall of civilizations. You know the civilizations I mean only too well. Our museums are full of them. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Minoan. Artifacts, their achievements, their relics are all around us. Scientists who study civilizations see a recurring pattern of growth and collapse operating on a cycle of somewhere between 300 and 500 years. So is our civilization similarly susceptible to collapse? Let's say that our civilization began around the mid-17th century, the age of the Enlightenment. This was the moment when the great escape began, as Angus Deaton puts it, when some of our countries began to escape the poverty and subsistence living of others. So let's put time zero in the mid-17th century, and that means we're about 350 years into our cycle. But of course, you and I are different, aren't we? We've got science, we have technology, we have vast resources. We're smarter than our predecessors. We have enlightened governments. We have a benevolent private sector. We, have, we can have rational debate in a socially conscious media. In every way, we are just better than our predecessors. But sadly, we might have to acknowledge that the Minoans, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and many others thought just the same when they were in the middle of their cycle of birth, growth, and decline. Two critical factors are going to shape our future. Ecological strain, the destroying of the natural resources of our planet, and second, economic stratification, the growing inequalities between and within countries. When those forces operate together, Collapse is hard to avoid, and the course of events is easy to describe. A rich group of countries and peoples will continue to grow richer, but in doing so, they damage the availability of resources for everyone else, the tragedy of the commons. Eventually, that uncontrolled overconsumption catches up with us. It causes a crisis and a decline amongst those living in the poorest circumstances. To begin with, the rich don't feel this. And so they ignore the impending catastrophe. They deny the danger. They oppose any change to their lifestyles or their ability to create and keep their wealth. But eventually, the continued destruction of our planetary resources causes a decline in wealth even among richer nations. And their populations enter a period of crisis too. Conflict, civil war, social chaos, famine, disease fragmentation and fracture, and eventually collapse. And then, that's it. The cycle of our civilization is complete. It's bedtime, the fairy tale is over, it's time to put out the light. 
What comes after 2015 is our opportunity to write a different story for our, uh, for our civilization. We know that sustainability is about all of us, not just some of us. It's about placing an equal weight on the future, not just about the present. It's about a different conception of what we mean by progress. Now, this is not new. It was all said in Gruhal and Brundtland's 1987 report on sustainable development, our common future. But her report was quickly followed by the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and the world entered a strangely euphoric state, tacking between utopian ideas of the end of history and a new world order. Two events launched the modern era of global health, the Millennium Declaration and 9-11. One was about ending poverty through rapid globalization to create market states. Market states that would benefit the rich world as much as they were supposed to benefit resource-poor countries. And the other, 9-11, was about the security agenda as a stimulus to invest in global health as an investment for defending our national security. Both events have been important, but they diverted us from the great opportunity that the Brundtland Report gave us. And 2015 allows us to return to her vision, to make global human security, not a narrow, narrow national security, our future priority. Because what we know is that by 2050, if we continue as we are today, our climates will have reached a point well outside the limits of any known historical variability. And those unprecedented climates, as my little fairy tale a moment ago foretold, will affect low-income countries the worst. But our future doesn't only depend upon the damage we've inflicted on our environment, nor even the vast disparities between countries. Our future depends upon the quality of our political institutions, our economic policies, and the way we choose to organize our societies. And that's what I would call planetary health. So what solutions are available to us? We already know a great deal about what we must do. And the issue is less what, but rather how. And here is where the health perspective may be helpful. Because with a lens of health, it tells us that we share common risks, common pathologies, potentially common outcomes across our societies. Our future truly is a common future. And the more that we can build this idea of a shared global identity, a shared civilization, the more likely it might be that we can recognize our interdependency and act together. If we choose to insulate ourselves nationally in our security, our economics, our politics, we will limit our ability to adapt. Daniel Cohen, in his book, The Prosperity of Vice, wrote, the postponement of death is the great novelty of the modern era. But the great novelty of the post-2015 era is the fragility, the uncertainty of our survival. Because of this predicament, the predicament we face now, we need a new direction to understand the ontogeny of civilizations, their birth, their growth, and their decline. And these are fundamental questions about who we are, what we're going to do, and about the possibilities for you, your family, and your civilization. Health is at the heart of our being. Survival is now at the center of our lives. The challenge of sustainability is to accept the fundamental instability of our world, to discover a future based on what we share, and to have the ambition, the optimism, and the courage to claim the incredible once-in-a-generation opportunity that lies before us. That is the goal of EAT. That is the goal of planetary health. Thank you. <laughs>